So good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Whitehawk, and I'm Vice Dean and Professor of Law at the UC Irvine School of Law. And I want to start by sending greetings to all of you from our Dean, Song Richardson, who unfortunately is unable to attend uh, this evening due to a conflict. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to evaluating the 2020 election, What's Next for American Democracy? A conversation with UCI law professors Rick Hassan and Henry, and Henry Weinstein. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize the team that has made this event possible, including Rebecca Bergeron, Anna Eiliff, Marianne Soden, who you just heard from, Josh Larson, and Colleen Terkani. Thanks to all of you. It goes without saying that given recent events, this evening's topic is as urgent and relevant as ever. And there could be nobody better to help us understand and navigate these issues than UCI law professors, Rick Hassan and Henry Weinstein. Rick Hassan is Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Science at UC Irvine and the nation's leading expert in election law. Professor Hassan holds a BA from UC Berkeley and a JD, MA, and PhD in Political Science from UCLA. He's an elected member of the American Law Institute and the author of numerous books and articles, most recently including Election Meltdown, Dirty Tricks, Distrust, and the Threat to American Democracy, which was published by Yale University Press in 2020. Last year, he chaired the Ad Hoc Committee for 2020 Election Fairness and Integrity, which issued a report on fair elections during a crisis and made recommendations that had real world impact. The Orange County Register recently named Professor Hassan one of the top 100 influencers in Orange County. And many of you may be familiar with him as a CNN election law analyst during this election cycle. Henry Weinstein is Professor of Lawyering Skills at UCI Law. Professor Weinstein holds both a BA and a JD from UC Berkeley. He's been a journalist for the Los Angeles Times, New York Times, San Francisco Examiner, and Wall Street Journal, and has written more than 3,000 stories, reporting on the ground in 36 states, plus the District of Columbia and Canada. Professor Weinstein has investigated and reported on the most pressing events and issues of our time, from Watergate to the Gulf War to Bush versus Gore. I'm in awe of my amazing UCI law colleagues like Rick and Henry, and I'm sure you'll understand why after this evening's event. Let me thank all of you for joining us virtually at UCI law this evening. And thank you, Henry and Wick, Rick, for uh, sharing uh, your conversation with us. I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris, and welcome again to the entire audience. Tonight's program marks the fifth one that I've done this year with Rick Hassan, I mean, during the last calendar year. And even though the last one was just a couple of months ago, it seems like decades given what's happened in the last several weeks. I've known Rick for 20 years. We were sort of joined at the hip when he was teaching in another law school and I was writing about Bush v. Gore. He's truly an expert on election law and the right to vote. And I guess more importantly, what that means is he's an expert on what it takes to establish and maintain a democratic society. One of the most famous stories about the nation's founding constitutional convention came, as the story goes, when a distinguished female Pennsylvania political activist, Elizabeth Willing Powell, saw Benjamin Franklin emerge from the hall where the constitution was being discussed. She saw Franklin and asked him, what have you given us, a monarchy or a republic? Franklin responded, a republic if you can keep it. I do not think it is an understatement to say that we have reached a moment when it is fair to ask whether we can keep it. As most of you know, I'm sure, the Capitol was attacked last week after President Trump continued to propagate fantasies that he had won the presidential election, said he would never give up and urge people to fight. Five people died in the Capitol skirmish as the invaders carried heavy arms and zip ties, shouted that the vice president should be hanged, the emergency panic button of a congresswoman was ripped off of her wall, and some wandered through the middle of our government carrying Confederate flags, smearing feces on walls, as well as slogans such as murder the media, and even, even wearing a t-shirt that proclaimed Camp Auschwitz. Over the past couple of days, we have had soldiers bivouac in the Capitol it's the first time that this has happened since the Civil War. Rick is sitting calmly in his home. I'm sitting calmly in my office, but let's not kid ourselves. This is nothing close to a normal period of time. Millions of people still don't believe the results of a presidential election where 
The winner, Biden, got 7 million more votes than the loser. He also um, beat him decisively in the Electoral College. And those results have withstood the test of more than 50 lawsuits, including a number that were decided by Republican judges, including judges that were appointed by President Donald Trump. In fact, three of the justices that he appointed to the Supreme Court, along with their colleagues, said that one case that got as far, got filed there, was not even worth hearing. But as you also know, there are still millions of people who don't seem to believe the results, even though they've been able to hear an audio tape of Trump asking the Secretary of State in Georgia to find him 11,780 more votes so that he could prevail in Georgia. Um, any person who wanted to hear that tape could hear it, but there still are millions of disbelievers. They seem to live in a fact-free universe, and that's clearly dangerous for democracy. As President Trump, I mean, pardon me, as President-elect Biden is set to come into office, he's also faced with an economic crisis and a, and a pandemic where more than 380,000 people, including more than 30,000 in California, have died. This is a very tough period. Before um, starting the chat with Rick, I wanna just quote one passage from a book that seems very important to the discussion we're having tonight. It's a book that came, was published in 2017 by the distinguished Yale University historian, Timothy Snyder. The book is called On Tyranny. It's a small but important book. I wanna read just one passage where Snyder proclaims the importance of believing in truth. Snyder wrote, to abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power because there is no basis upon which to do so. If nothing is true, then all is spectacle. The biggest mouthpiece pays for the most blinding lights. So Rick, I'd like to start by asking a big picture question. Earlier this week, you published a piece in Slate saying that many in the country are now worried seriously about the fate of democratic governments in the US. So Rick, start by telling us your view of what led up to the current moment and what are some of the steps we need to take to preserve our democracy? Thanks, Henry. And let me first thank uh, Rebecca, Marianne, and, and uh, Anna and Colleen and, and everyone at UCI, as well as uh, Chris for the very warm introduction. Uh, I, I can't believe we're having our fifth discussion, as you said, during this election season. And each one has been more dire than the last because uh, you know when we started, I think the first time that we had a discussion in this calendar year, I was talking about my new book, Election Meltdown, which came out in February. It was pre-pandemic. It kind of seems like it was a hundred years ago. I mean, the, this country has gone through a lot of trauma uh, over the last uh, 10 months. Um, We're in a period of economic and uh, health crises unrelated to politics and yet related to politics because part of what's happened um, and part of what framed the 2020 election was the response to the pandemic. And also, of course, the pandemic shaped how people voted. Uh, many people voted by mail for the first time and absentee balloting in many states was expanded. And so when we talked a little bit later in the year, we talked about the challenges of trying to run a safe and fair election during a pandemic when people can't be together. But also what we saw and what I presaged in election meltdown, many others saw as well, was a presidential candidate in Donald Trump who was willing to take um, claims of voter fraud, which had been floating around uh, kind of in within mostly fringe Republican circles for the better part of two decades. Uh, I mean, we could trace it back longer, but the, the, the modern focus comes after Bush versus Gore in, in the early 2000s. And he kind of uh, supersized and weaponized it. And so when we issued that report that Chris referenced back uh, in April, uh, the report that came out of a conference called Can American Democracy Survive the 2020 Elections, which was held in February on the UCI Law Campus, which gives you a sense that this is not a new problem. When we published that report, we asked the question, how can we assure a peaceful transition of power? Which is something that we never really had to ask before in modern American history. I recall on my election law blog back in 2008, when George W. Bush was ending his term and Barack Obama was beginning his term, and it was the night before the inauguration, I just remarked on 
uh, how we all take for granted the peaceful transition of power that we could go from a conservative Republican to a liberal Democrat as a moment of celebration that both uh, the old and new president would stand together and there would be this peaceful transition of power. And of course, Republicans were disappointed that they didn't win that election, but they would just put up a candidate the next time. And they did, and Mitt Romney came and Mitt Romney lost that election to Barack Obama. He was a very competent candidate, uh, but couldn't beat the incumbent. Beating the incumbent's a hard thing to do. Nobody wondered whether Mitt Romney was going to claim the election was rigged or stolen. But Donald Trump had taken kind of the playbook of uh, would-be authoritarians, uh, claiming that if he didn't win the election, uh, it had to be rigged. And once the election happened uh, on election night, in part thanks to the pandemic and in part thanks to Republican legislatures in Michigan and Pennsylvania that refused to allow the early processing of absentee ballots, uh, the election was too early to call for a number of days. And that created a, a period of uncertainty. By the Saturday after election day, the networks uh, and the news organizations were ready to call the election for Joe Biden. They did call the election for Joe Biden. And um, not only did Donald Trump not concede, but on that Saturday, the very day that the networks called the election for Joe Biden, I wrote a piece in Slate saying, now is the time for Mitch McConnell to come out and say that this election is over and that Biden was the winner. McConnell did not do that. He said, let's let the process play out, even though it was clear already by then that there were no major problems with the election that could have flipped election results in at least three states that you would need to make a difference in the outcome of the election. And for months after that Saturday, for two months, the president continued in litigation in, on Twitter, in the court of public opinion, to make wildly unsubstantiated claims of fraud, claims that were debunked and rejected by courts, as you said, made up of Democratic and Republican judges, that were debunked by journalists doing their job, journalists who were attacked as enemies of the people for doing their job. And not only did Trump try to win through a, a long shot legal strategy, which already by November 17th, I wrote a piece in The Atlantic explaining that Trump would need the equivalent of three consecutive Hail Marys to try to win the election in court. He went beyond that. He tried to convince members of county canvassing boards that normally play a, only a ceremonial role in some states to not accept the results of the election. And then, uh, as you mentioned, he tried to pressure the governor of uh, some states, including Georgia and Arizona, and tried to pressure election officials to claim that there was fraud. And then by the end, which I think, and I wrote about this at Slate as well, committed a crime in asking the Georgia Secretary of State to manufacture just enough votes so that he gets one more vote than Joe Biden. And then, of course, uh, in addition to trying to pressure let, um, governors and Secretary of State, he tried to pressure state legislatures to appoint alternative slates of electors, something that really shouldn't be allowed under these state laws once they allowed voters to vote. And then uh, when that failed, um, he had electors meet anyway, and they tried to turn the action to Mike Pence and play the Pence card. This brings us up to the events of January 6th. The claim was made that Mike Pence, the vice president who served primarily as the master of ceremonies on January 6th in the counting of the electoral college votes. Uh, he, uh, Trump claimed, uh, even though there was no good uh, reason to claim it, that Pence had the power to decide which states votes to accept and to essentially decide the outcome of the presidential election. And while he was putting pressure on Pence to break our normal democratic rules, he also encouraged his supporters to come to uh, Washington. He more than once tweeted about how it's going to be wild in Washington. And we now know that this led to an actual insurrection, the death of five people, injury of others, putting members of Congress in terror. And according to some reports within just less than a minute of being taken hostage or even killed. Really one of the most dramatic moments and just the thought that we could go from that Within the last week, we went from that moment of the Capitol under siege to it being um, thankfully uh, um, returned to order by uh, law enforcement to counting the votes. I watched until it was at 3.45 a.m. on the East Coast when uh, Joe Biden was officially declared the winner to 
calls for impeachment to actual impeachment in one week. I mean, just time has just been moved up and now there'll be a Senate trial. And President Trump in the last few hours has made some, some statements of contrition uh, or I don't know if we want to call it that. He's he's called for no violence. He has still not conceded the race to Joe Biden in some of his statements. He said he loved the people who went and committed this sedition. Um, in uh, uh, in some of his other statements, he's tried to be more muted. Uh, but it's clear that this is not over. And according to press reports, um, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies are worried about possible violence on January 20th. So I feel like we can't really breathe a sigh of relief right now. There are more troops in the US Capitol than we have right now in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Uh, this is just a really, you see the pictures of, there was a picture today posted by a New York Times reporter of some soldiers posing in front of a statue of Rosa Parks in the uh, Capitol Rotunda. I mean, this is a place that if we didn't have a pandemic would be full of tourists, uh, would be full of elementary school students getting their, their tours. Uh, it shouldn't have to be full of soldiers, uh, soldiers in masks, uh, soldiers who today complained that some of the Republican legislators were coming and speaking to them without wearing masks and exposing them to the possibility of the virus. I mean, I didn't get to the second part of your question and we can talk about what to do about it, but I just wanted to set, take a few minutes and set the scene and talk about how unprecedented this is, that we cannot right now take for granted the idea that we would have a peaceful transition of power. And over many months, I spent time explaining to um, very worried people around the country about these lawsuits and what could happen and what could the courts do. And, I'm not, and I kept explaining that if the courts follow the rules, we're fine because there is no merit to these lawsuits. So I said, well, what if the courts don't follow the rules? What if Mike Pence doesn't follow the rules? You know, so now we're getting out of the realm of law and into the realm of questions about political power and civil military relations. I'll, and I'll just end with this before I turn it back to you. If 43,000 people would have voted differently across three states, Donald Trump would have still won the election uh, in the Electoral College, even though Joe Biden received 7 million more votes. That itself would have provoked a different kind of legitimacy crisis. And so while some of this is about Donald Trump, it's not all about Donald Trump. And the, you know we have to do some real soul searching about how we conduct our elections and what our rules are before we can think about how we can create greater stability uh, in this country. Thank you for that very comprehensive uh a set of comments, Rick. Um, and before going to my next question, I have to say, I, I guess I find it a little more than ironic to hear that a group of soldiers was uh, posing in front of a statue of Rosa Parks. I don't think Donald Trump has ever done that. Um, Christopher Krebs, who was the head of cybersecurity this year, was fired by the president um, after he said that the election had been free and fair. I, I believe that that's a conclusion that you for the most part agree with, but nonetheless, I know that you think that there are def that our election system is fragile. So for the moment, why don't you just talk a bit more about what you see are some of the potential, you know, fragile points and what we can do to shore them up. All right, so one thing to, to um, say, uh, I think at, at the beginning of, of a discussion about a successful election system is that why do we care about a successful election? And it's because what, what makes a country a democracy is not only that you have a free and fair vote, but that the losers of the election accept that result as legitimate. And if the losers don't accept the results as legitimate, you don't have a democracy because um, uh, it, it requires a kind of social compact. And so when um, Hillary Clinton lost the election and people started calling uh, on, on the left, started calling Trump an illegitimate president, right? So th this was already a sign. Uh, or when, if we go back even further, when Donald Trump and others accused Barack Obama of being a, 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 uh, a born in Kenya, the, the whole birther movement, and he was not a legitimate president for that reason. When you start having uh, concerns about the election being legitimate and, and Clinton's concerns had a lot to do with Russian interference in the election. Uh, Russian interference, which was brazen, uh, Russian interference that may not have actually changed the result, but convinced many people on the left that the election was not conducted fairly. 
So we face two sets of challenges simultaneously. One is how do you conduct a fair election? But the other is how do you convince people that we've had a fair election? And what this particular election shows us that is that um, uh, if you have a charismatic leader like Donald Trump, who's willing to lie repeatedly about election fraud, millions of people are going to believe it, despite all the evidence, despite the fact that, uh, as you said, the election was mostly free and fair uh, in the United States. We had isolated pockets of problems. I mean, I think that there were a number of court decisions that made it harder for people to vote in the midst of a pandemic, which were wrongheaded. I don't think it was a fully fair election. Uh, I think that uh, we should have had more easing of the rules for voting by mail uh, in the course of, of voting during a pandemic. But it was not so substantially infected with that kind of problem that um, we would call it an, uh, you know, a fundamentally unfair election. There are lots of things we could have done to improve the election. Look, I favor in the long term moving to national nonpartisan administration of elections like they do in basically every other country, uh, every other advanced democracy in the world. They don't use uh, partisan election officials on the local level deciding presidential elections. Now, some people think that actually worked in our favor this time. If we had a federal election system, then Trump could have tried to manipulate that too. And so, you know, I would only favor a federal system that is completely insulated from politics, a truly independent system where kind of like the Federal Reserve model or, or, or something like that. So we have to think on two levels. On the level of what it takes to um, conduct a fair election, then there are a lot of election administration changes we could make. As I mentioned, the change to nonpartisan uh, nationalized election administration, there are things that could be done that are much more incremental, like um, Congress passed a law requiring states to offer some period of early voting, either in person or absentee or something like that. Um, uh, uh, taking away the discretion of people like the members of the Wayne County, Michigan canvassing board who might, who, who play a ceremonial role only, but might uh, try to mess with uh, the, the results. Uh, we might think about changing the rules in the Electoral Count Act, which govern how we, um, count, have Congress count the electoral college votes. Maybe it shouldn't be just one Senator and one representative that has to join an objection, but you need 20% of the body to do so. And the rules need to spell out what would be the grounds for objection because there, there, were, there was no good legal basis to object to the counting of the votes in uh, Arizona or in Pennsylvania as were debated in the House and Senate on January 6th after this was over. So there's a whole set of things we could do there. Um, but that's not going to address the legitimacy crisis. That alone is not, I, I think of a fair election as a necessary but not sufficient condition for people to accept results as legitimate, right? If you have a, a fundamentally unfair election, if you can stop the ballot box, then of course people are not going to accept it. But what do we do about the prevalence of misinformation and disinformation? Um, it was kind of like, I think about it, you know, the insurrection and you looked at kind of almost the comical look of some of these uh, uh, invaders who were deadly serious, but, but dressed, it was kind of like the comments section in like on the worst, you know, if you think back to 2003, when the LA Times would start allowing people to comment on their stories, and you'd get this cesspool of comments. It's kind of like the comment section came to life. And, uh, you know, when you lose the press and you lose the courts uh, and you lose um, civil society as intermediary mechanisms by which people decide what's true and what's not true, then as Timothy Snyder says, uh, you lose the ability to have a modern and fair society. If people can be so manipulated by conspiracy theories, by a president to believe all of these false claims, then we're really in trouble. And so I do think that it was a good move for Twitter and Facebook to have removed Donald Trump's ability to comment. He's actually been pretty quiet, even though he could call into Fox News as much as he wants, he hasn't been doing much, right? He's, he, and so those steps are a good Band-Aid now to get us through the next few weeks, um, uh, as are um, the, 
steps that are being taken to provide extra security, not only in the US capital, but in state capitals. But that's not a long-term solution to our problems. And one of the tasks is gonna to have to be to rebuild um, intermediary institutions that can help to um, let people differentiate between truth and falsity, between conspiracy theories and real life. You know, and as things move more online and become more virtual, people can become more sucked into this kind of stuff. And I think that is a much bigger challenge. That's actually the project I'm working on now. Uh, I'm working on a book now called Cheap Speech and what we need to do to try to reinvigorate American elections in an era when disinformation online is so prevalent. Right, well, that seems to be a particularly challenging problem in, in several in several respects, one thing is I know a lot of people um, are taking comfort for the moment um, that Trump has, uh, you know, is off of Twitter and some other social media platforms, and I count myself as one of them. On the other hand, you also have people raising concerns, and not just from the right, about um, an incredible amount of power that seems to be vested in a few hands of large corporations that have a major impact on free speech. That's right. Uh, there was a, an op-ed today in the uh, New York Times by Eugene Volokh, who's a leading libertarian First Amendment scholar, who said, well, these are private companies, they can do what they want, but it is somewhat troubling that, you know, what uh, Mark and Jack think, right? Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey, the heads of, of uh, Facebook and, 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 and Twitter matter so much. And he kind of left unsaid what to do about it. And I think you know, one thing that he mentioned there and that, that you mentioned just now and how you phrased the question is the, the answer there might be antitrust law, right? Just like in the, you know, in the 1950s, you know, we were worried about uh, you know, certain kinds of companies. We were worried about uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS, or we were worried about you know, General Motors or IBM, right? We're worried about companies uh, having a, uh, a monopoly in the marketplace mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, of, phys of physical goods, or in the case of the news networks of a of a limited spectrum, all right, because there are only so many TV stations that could be broadcast before the advent of cable and, and the internet. Um, we have a, a market concentration right now. Certainly, there are lots of different platforms, but Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, and let me add to that Google Search. Nothing would stop Google from, there's no law right now that would stop Google from manipulating its search and, and not disclosing it. Uh, that would, for example, provide only positive statements about one presidential candidate and only negative statements about another. They're a private company. They can, they can produce whatever they want, right? And uh, you know, trying to come up with regulation that would say, uh, you know, impose a kind of fairness doctrine or impose uh, an equal time rule uh, that those things become problematic too, especially if you think about who's going to be deciding those things. So would you really want the Trump Justice Department or the Trump-led uh, um, Federal Trade Commission or Federal Communications Commission to be able to make determinations as to what's even-handed? Uh, you know, and uh, the, one of the I great ironies of... Um, Trump's later demands about social media, where he felt he was being he, he felt he was being treated unfairly, uh, even before he was removed from these platforms, because Twitter and Facebook were labeling some of his tweets. So he'd he'd make a totally bogus statement about voter fraud, and it would say something pretty mild uh, by the social media company, like this uh, this fact is being disputed, or. Uh, Joe Biden has been declared the winner, you know, click here for more information. And they weren't even great um, explanations for, you know, what was going on. But Trump's answer to that was to repeal uh, something known as Section 230 of uh, the Communications uh, Decency Act back in, in, I think, in 1996, which essentially says that if you're, you know, one of, if you're, uh, have a website or, you know, some kind of uh, internet site like Twitter or Facebook or the Washington Post, uh, you uh, have immunity from uh, uh, liability, for example, if somebody posts something libelous. So somebody uh, posts something libelous on Twitter, you can't sue Twitter for it the way you might be able to sue the LA Times if somebody wrote an op-ed that was full of libel. 
And Trump thinks that repealing this immunity, and he in fact vetoed a, a must-pass military bill that for Congress overrode, it was the first override of a, of a presidential veto uh, in, in Trump's time, I guess it will be the last as well. Trump wants, wanted to have included in there a repeal of Section 230. And if you repeal Section 230, what that would mean is that the uh, platforms would have to engage in more content moderation and they would have removed more of Trump's tweets. And if you think, uh, as the studies I think show, that more disinformation is flowing on these fringe conservative sites than they are in say more central, centrist sites or even leftist sites, then if you repeal 230, you would see even less speech from uh, a, 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 um, someone like Trump who's making claims, you know, some of his claims about voting machines already have provoked lawsuits about, you know, claims about voting machines being rigged. So uh, section two, repealing, two section, repealing section 230 liability doesn't seem to be an answer. Now, the other thing that we've seen this week, you know, everyone's, you know, I, I, maybe this is a little cynical and I, I'm interested in what you think about this, Henry, but this kind of um, last minute conversion, this come to Jesus moment that corporate America has now had, we're gonna take Trump down. We're going to, um, we're not gonna make donations to, the, uh, to those Republicans, at least we're gonna hold, be on hold for do donations to those Republicans who voted in favor of the objections on January 6th. Very conveniently, all of this happened right when um, the Democrats gained control of the Senate on January 5th, when there were the runoff elections in Georgia and Democrats captured both of those seats. And so I kind of wonder if this is a kind of expediency rather than trying to actually, um, or rather than actually showing uh, a disagreement with a, with a profoundly anti-democratic small d strategy that Trump has done, it seems much more politically expedient for the social media companies and everyone else who are now going to be subject to regulation by a democratic Congress and a democratic president to be backing uh, away from Trump and being more interested in trying to control uh, the dialogue to the point even where Parler, P-A-R-L-E-R, -E which was an alternative site to Twitter, you saw uh, both Google and Apple, two huge companies that don't have uh, a lot of competition for what they do, two huge companies deciding to remove the Parler app from their app stores, essentially shutting down the ability of new users to get on there. And then um, uh, Amazon, which was the web hosting company deciding not to host Parler. Um, I do worry about media concentration, um, but I do also wonder whether this is just a temporary pulling back and willingness to police bad conduct because the political winds have shifted. Well, Rick, I have to say, I share um, some, of your, uh, some of your cynicism about, about those moves. I also have to say, as somebody who worked as a reporter for a long time, there's also, I think, some things that journalists, at least, particularly in the broadcast media, could do to sort of, um, you know, exercise some more social responsibility. And or I just want to briefly say, you, you mentioned the birtherism thing um, some moments ago. And for months, birtherism was, in fact, a commercial success for cable networks who fostered food fights. I mean, the fact was, is that an enterprising reporter could have gone on one flight, gotten the original birth certificate in Hawaii, and this could have just ended right there. I mean, it was a totally specious argument, but in fact was it drove, it drove audiences. So, which is a regrettable thing, but you know, that's that under our current system, it can't be policed. I'm not sure it should be policed, but clearly there ought to be a lot more responsibility exercised by people saying that there is an actual legitimate fight um, you know, when there isn't one, it was just sort of like when the cigarette company said their products weren't, uh, weren't unsafe. I'd like to just turn back to voting um, for a few moments. Um, you said, uh, and I think quite appropriately so, that, that, that there were limitations uh, placed on voting. The uh, majority of the Supreme Court didn't seem to recognize how the pandemic would, it, would affect voting. So Joe would affect, you know, limitations on voting. So Joe Biden is about to be inaugurated. Um, at least as scheduled um, on January the 20th. He's also coming in with uh, the um, narrowest possible majority in the Senate and a 
pretty narrow majority in the House where he faces some particularly truculent opposition. And I'm just curious whether or not you think that the Trump administration, I mean, the, the Biden, the new Biden administration can actually elect uh, some, some, enact some legislation that will put some real oomph back into the Voting Rights Act and do it in a way that will survive a test at this Supreme Court. Right. And yes, yeah, so this brings you back to the first question, which I never got to uh, finish answering because I gave you such a long answer to the first part, which is what's our problem? So yeah, turning oh, to the solutions, I think, is an important thing to do. And I had a piece in Slate this week that I think was sent out to the participants in this webinar, uh, What's Next for American Democracy? And I said, really, we need to deal uh, with uh, two problems simultaneously. Uh, number one, um, we need to make changes in rules so that we can't have consistent minoritarian government in the United States. Now, ideally that would mean on the presidential level, uh, getting rid of the electoral college. But I, I think that that's not going to happen in our lifetimes. And that's just because the path to overturn electoral college, um, the electoral college system would require uh, getting um, uh, a two thirds majority in Congress to pass a constitutional amendment and then three quarters of the state legislatures to agree. And I don't think that's going to happen because there are too many states, both uh, red states, seeing that Democrats have been winning the popular vote in almost every election uh, for the last uh, 25 years, um, as well as small states that are close that would see their influence diminish. Um, so if we can't make changes to the Electoral College, we, we need to make other changes that deal with the problem of minoritarian rule. Uh, so for example, admitting Washington DC and Puerto Rico as states, that's something that could be done uh, under a, a, a Biden uh, administration. And um, passing a new John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Now there is an existing, or well, from the last Congress, there was a John Lewis Voting Rights Act which restored preclearance, the part of the Voting Rights Act that the Supreme Court killed in the 2013 Shelby County case. It's not clear to me, it would depend on the details as to whether or not something like that would be upheld by this new, even more conservative Supreme Court, right? We've had, with the death of Justice Ginsburg, something we didn't mention, something else very momentous that happened. We went from a five to four court, five conservatives to, to four liberals, where sometimes the liberals could pick off a conservative justice to a 6-3 court, which makes that task much more difficult. So I think it is possible to draft a new preclearance provision, but there may be other things that could be done that would be more likely to stand the test of time under Congress's powers in Article 1, Section 4 to set the rules for congressional elections. So for example, Congress could require every state to um, uh, offer two weeks of early in-person or absentee voting. Something like that could definitely be on the table. Uh, in addition to changes that would deal with the problem of Republican minoritarian rule, uh, I mean, the idea that someone could get 7 million fewer votes and become president is just kind of one, one example of many of minoritarian rule. Uh, the other problem is one of bolstering Republican moderates. I think the question, you know, what we need in this country are two vibrant political parties that are big tent parties that compete for as many voters as possible. But that was the George W. Bush vision of the Republican Party, compassionate conservatism, outreach, for example, to Latino voters and, and all of that. And that wing of the party, that more establishment wing, maybe think about it as the Chamber of Commerce or the Business Roundtable wing of the Republican Party, is at war with the Trumpist wing, which is you know, nativist, uh, anti-immigrant, xenophobic, racist, anti-Semitic, you know, it's like the very worst elements of um, the, the Trumpist uh, tone. That part of the party is already threatening to primary the 10 members of Congress who are Republicans who voted in favor of impeachment today. And the question is, how do you get it? How do you change the rules so that moderates can um, have a better chance at staying in office. And one answer might be, look at Lisa Murkowski. Uh, she's a Republican, but she runs in Alaska and Alaska changed its primary system. So now it's a top four primary. And so she doesn't have to worry about being primary from the right. And so one thing Congress could do, you asked about what, what could be done with, uh, with Congress and the Biden administration is 
they could, and that's that same power that lets them set the rules for absentee balloting in congressional elections, they could require the use of nonpartisan or bipartisan commission systems to choose uh, how to draw districts, creating fewer gerrymandered districts. Maybe you get fewer Jim Jordans and Matt Gateses because that's the worry. It's the Gates, the Jordan, the Holly, the, the Cruz, the ones that uh, don't seem to be, um, uh, they don't seem to be the, the ones who are the, the most um, responsible, you know, for uh, maintaining democracy. And so uh, bolstering Republican moderates, I think, is really important so that both parties, so you don't have one party looking to suppress the vote, looking to pass new laws. And look at Georgia after this uh, win, Biden wins, uh, Warnock wins, Ossoff wins, right? You have Biden and then a black preacher and a a uh, Jewish son of immigrants winning in Georgia of all places. Now the Georgia legislature, which is still dominated by Republicans, is talking about cutting back on absentee balloting because we don't want to make voting too easy, right? So Congress could come in there. Now, ordinarily the Senate is a roadblock to voting reform because it takes 60 votes to get most things through the Senate. And in this slate piece, I argue that Democrats should favor getting rid of the filibuster for voting reform that we need to play what uh, Professor David Posen of Columbia Law School calls constitutional anti-hardball. The idea is you gotta play really tough tactics like blowing up the filibuster in order to pass rules that prevent gamesmanship and voting in the future. And like try to level the playing field and make the rules fair. It's a real long shot because people like uh, Joe Manchin, one of the Democrats in, in Congress comes from West Virginia, a state that Donald Trump won by more than 30 points very conservative, he doesn't want to blow up the filibuster. Could you get him on board for something like this? Or could you get a Susan Collins or a Lisa Murkowski on board, right? It's a tall order. They've disappointed liberals many times before. So it's a tough order. It's a very narrow majority in both the Senate and the House. It wouldn't be easy. Joe Biden also on his agenda, he's got climate change. He's got the pandemic. He's got, you know, the Iranian deal. I mean, there's just so the Paris Climate Accords is just so much on the agenda. It's gonna be very tough coming in. And he might be dealing with the remnants of this insurrection and you know, having to deal with law enforcement. Merrick Garland, who's going to be his attorney general is gonna to have to figure out, should anyone in the Trump administration be prosecuted for any crimes? It's going to be tough to get voting reform done, but I think it's really important going forward because I don't think even if Donald Trump himself uh, doesn't run for office again in 2024. He might even be disqualified by the Senate after the vote on after his impeachment. Um, Trumpism is not going away. Rick, um, you answered in uh, some of your responses a number of the questions that have come in from people in the audience before the program. But I want to pose to you um, one question uh, that comes that's related to your comment about um, whether Trumpism will be ongoing, and. Uh, person asked the following, what restrictions, if any, are there on how Trump uses the millions he has raised after the election, ostensibly for his vote challenges? Would he be restricted to using these for campaigns, his own or others, or restricted to using it for public ends, or pay for unrelated legal expenses for himself or for others, or able openly to use it for personal expenses, that is, without needing to claim they were something else? It's a great question, and um, I should point out that uh, what happened after the election is that uh, Trump solicited funds uh, repeatedly from his supporters to, to fight uh, the election results. And when you made a donation to this fund, uh, at first it was 60%, and then it was 75% of the money you were giving was not going to Trump's recount fund. It was instead going to something that's known as a leadership pack which essentially works as a slush fund for uh, political leaders. So, you know, Nancy Pelosi, um, Mitch McConnell, they all have these funds. And what they do is they raise a lot of money uh, and they use it to dole out favors and, and, and they use it to, to support other candidates for office, um, other federal candidates. So uh, Trump is going to come in with this slush fund and I should say they raised over $200 million after the election, which is an astounding amount of money. And then about you know, two thirds of that probably is in the slush fund as opposed to in the recount fund. With the recount funds, 
he can transfer those to the party. There are certain rules he could transfer to other um, uh, candidates for federal office. He can't do much in terms of his, his personal uh, life. He can't, I don't think he would be able to use it, for example, for uh, after he's out of office to defend himself, say if there are criminal charges against the Trump organization brought, you know, tax charges brought by the state of New York. But as to the leadership pack, which has probably well over $100 million, there's a lot of room for, um, you, the, the rules are very loose. There's a lot of room for using it for personal expenses. You know, so trips that he takes around the country, staying at fancy places, uh, meals, like all kinds of things like that. He would be able to use those funds uh, in that way. Uh, and so uh, I don't think, you know, if, if Trump decides he's not running in 2024, I don't think he cares enough about politics that he's going to really want to be supporting other candidates for office or, or, you know, other than tweeting about who he likes and who he doesn't like or, or helping his friends. Uh, but he could make, go through the motions, keep this fund alive and do all kinds of things that will line his own pockets. Uh, so it turned out to be a very lucrative proposition for him to continue to challenge the election. Uh, and I think in some ways mislead his supporters into thinking they were giving money that was actually going to make a difference in terms of the election outcome. I mean, even with Rudy Giuliani supposedly charging $20,000 a day for what I consider to be the worst lawyering in an election case I've seen in 25 years of following these cases, there's still going to be millions and millions of dollars left over. Well, it sounds like that is another area that is potentially ripe for reform um, in terms of what somebody can do with money like uh, that. Um, I think when uh, you know people give to a, you know a fund like that, and in fact, um, the question of what Trump has done with his monies in New York is the subject of of some inquiries going on by New York by New York authorities um, at the moment. Well, and let me just remind you because. It seems like ancient history, but you may remember that Trump was an unindicted co-conspirator in the Michael Cohen case involving the payment of hush money to um, Stormy Daniels, uh, the, um, the pornographic film actress who uh, was um, paid $130,000 for her silence, for her story, supposedly through the National Enquirer. And that money came from campaign funds uh, or, um, was a, I, I, should, I misspoke, though that, that was arguably a campaign expense because the money came out as a way of um, trying to keep the story out of the news when Trump was um, running for office. And uh, he was listed as individual A in the indictment. And I do not believe the statute of limitations will have run at the time that Trump is out of office. And uh, I don't know who's going to be appointed to be the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, which is a very powerful position, uh, but that could be revived. Uh, and uh, Merrick Garland is supposedly going to be given uh, a room without political interference. I don't know what he's going to decide about these cases. And of course, right, there are the, the state cases. I think that Georgia uh, might be a place where Trump will be um, uh, prosecuted. Uh, the Fulton County, Fulton County is uh, you know, where, where Atlanta is. The Fulton, there's a new Fulton County District Attorney and she is empowered to bring people on charges for violating election uh, laws, including those involving fraud. And it sure sounded to me like Trump was soliciting uh, the Secretary of State of Georgia to get him to commit election fraud. And he could be up for charges. Now, maybe uh, as a political decision, uh, charges are not going to be brought, but he's going to be in, in a, a lot of legal jeopardy. And um, as much as people are, is it the expression chomping at the bit or ch I think chomping at the bit for that to happen? Um, you know, just like a wounded animal could be the most dangerous, you know, when Trump's out of office, what's he going to say? What is he going to exhort his supporters to do if he's in even more trouble? So that does raise concerns for me. Well, we've talked, we're getting near the end and we've talked about a number of topics that are, are pretty downbeat. So I'd like to <laughs> ask you a question that I think at least some members of the audience would consider more upbeat. And that's a question that came from a member of the audience that said, can Democrats, this turning back to Georgia, can Democrats replicate what Stacey Abrams did in Georgia in other states or 
in terms of turning out the vote and taking a state that was a heavily red state, which now Biden won, um, first time they ever elected an African American center, a, uh, a, uh, a first time they ever elected a Jewish center. Do you think that can be replicated in other parts of the country? Is there something particularly unique about Georgia? I don't think there's something unique about Georgia other than that um, it was changing demographically and you had a very highly motivated um, uh, and, and sophisticated politi political organization. Um, you may remember back to um, Howard Dean um, who talked about having a 50 state strategy. And you know, this was laughed at, this is what back in, um, in the nineties, right? The idea was, you know, well, you know, maybe we could um, uh, you know, start winning in these other places. Uh, and um, it turns out that grassroots organizing makes a tremendous difference. And if you think about, for example, how close the house is right now, having more um, uh, organization, even to capture one or two more seats in some of these states that might be, um, you know, red states, uh, there certainly is the potential to grow the coalition. And the other thing that's happening, and this is what is uh, really, um, uh, I think the, uh, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, what, what, is, what are things going to look like five or 10 years down the line as the parties are realigning? This is something that um, is very hard to picture, I wrote a, uh, uh, something for a symposium in, in, uh, in, in Drake, a Drake Law Review. I, I remember going to uh, Iowa, uh, this was maybe 10 years ago, as the Tea Party was really ascendant and talking about how I could imagine this breakup of the Republican Party into a Tea Party wing and, uh, uh, you know, the, again, the kind of the Chamber of Commerce wing. And I really see Trumpism as the uh, natural successor to the Tea Party. Um, if it turns out that um, what we end up with in the United States are two parties, one of which is pre pre predominantly rural and white, and the other of which is a coalition between kind of multicultural city people and business uh, leaders. And, um, you know, I, I have a number of, um, uh, of, of friends in, in California who consider themselves to be socially liberal, fiscally conservative Republicans uh, who would never have thought to vote for Democrats before uh, the last couple of years, but have now shifted, right? So when you're thinking about, can you replicate what happened in Georgia and other places, a lot depends on what the coalitions look like. And, uh, you know, frankly, when it comes to Congress, a lot's going to depend upon how much gerrymandering can be done. That's not a topic we've uh, talked much about today, but let me just spend a minute on it. So for example, North Carolina um, engaged in some of the most egregious gerrymandering in the last uh, um, decade. This will start again after the census is completed. The census itself is its own complex area. But um, in uh, North Carolina, uh, they drew, uh, it's essentially a 50-50 state and they drew their 13 congressional districts so that Republicans controlled 10 of the 13 seats. Well, now the state Supreme Court has a democratic majority and it is policing partisan gerrymandering as a matter of state constitutional law. And now there is a, um, uh, as an offshoot of the litigation that took place in the context of this presidential election, there's a question of how much state constitutions, uh, how much state Supreme Courts have the power to use state constitutions to mess with what state legislatures do when it comes to setting rules for congressional elections. The Supreme Court may take one of those cases. And so there's going to be this huge question which is going to have major implications for gerrymandering over whether or not uh, state courts are going to be able to rein in partisan gerrymandering because the Supreme Court a few years ago in a case called Rucho versus North Carolina said that federal courts are not going to be doing that. So control of Congress may depend in part on this fight among the state Supreme Courts, state legislatures, and the federal courts over this question. In, in his introduction, Chris talked about the, um, the special, or I'll call it a commission that you presided over 
about uh, can American democracy survived after a conference. And I was wondering if you could, I think it would be useful for the audience to know what came of that and, and what, was, what was implemented and, and, and what's left to be done. So the conference had a very pinpointed scope. Um, and uh, what I did was I gathered leaders, uh, professors and, 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 and lawyers and, and, and political scientists and leaders in the areas of law, politics, media, and tech. Uh, and, uh, and I asked uh, this group to come up with recommendations solely pinpointed to get the United States through the 2020 elections. That was a way that we were able to achieve consensus because we weren't talking about long-term changes. We were talking about much more uh, specific things. So for example, one of the key recommendations that we made and that we pushed, and I think that we were successful in getting the message out on, was that the media needed to convey to the American public that on election night, the results would be too early to call. And that a candidate might try to declare victory early, but we might not know for days who the uh, president was. And the reason we knew back in April when we issued the report that this was potentially a problem was because we knew that a lot of these states were shifting to mail-in balloting for the first time. And because some of these states didn't allow for pre-processing of ballots, we knew it would take days and days to count those ballots. And so we really hammered home the message and we had meetings with um, uh, those who are you know, decision desks and those who were producers on, on uh, the network shows and talking to members of, of, of newspapers and other news media, get out the message too early to call. And I think that was really important because uh, according to some reporting at least, you may remember that on election night, Fox News was out early from its decision desk. And it's a very good decision desk. They're, you know, they're very uh, careful and they're not you know, propagandists. They're, they're social scientists looking at this. They called Arizona for Biden. That was maybe too early of a call. It actually took the other networks, on, I think six more days before they were willing to do it. And um, the, there was reporting that if, if, if Arizona remained uncalled, but Trump was in the lead and he was in the lead until we got close to uh, the end of the counting, that, um, that Trump was actually going to declare victory. And that would have been so much worse for the country because then Trump would have been the victor uh, in the minds of his supporters. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and that um, would have made it even harder to convince more people that, that when Biden was ultimately declared the winner, that he was the legitimate winner of the election. So a key recommendation of ours was, was about that, um, uh, the role of the media. And I think that one of all of them got through, but we had other recommendations. For example, every state should make absentee and early voting easier in the process of the pandemic. And that had a kind of a mixed reaction. Uh, some states, many states did make uh, voting easier. There were some states that did not. But even if you take a place like Texas, Texas is a very interesting story because Texas fought all the way to the Supreme Court against expanding absentee balloting. Uh, in Texas, if you're over 65, you can get an absentee ballot, but if you're under 65, you have to have a disability. And the state Supreme Court said, fear of contracting COVID because you lack immunity is not a disability. Uh, they fought like anything to um, uh, stop the absentee balloting, but they had expanded early voting. And uh, Greg Abbott, the governor was out and, and went with that early voting, ironically, um, he was sued by the Republican Party for expanding early voting because it was seen that it was going to hurt. But I think the most interesting part of that whole story is that turnout was a record in Texas, and yet Republicans did quite well, right? For all the talk that there was going to be this demographic change and that um, Democrats were going to take over Texas, uh, in fact, Republicans made gains in uh, legislative races. Trump comfortably won the state. And I think one lesson that I would like Republicans to draw from that is that expanding the electorate doesn't necessarily help Democrats. It's a good small d democracy thing to do to make it easier for people to vote. We know that voter fraud is quite rare. The, you know, I was reading an article today about um, fraud in Pennsylvania because there were so many allegations of fraud in Pennsylvania. So far, there's been only one case that's brought. And it was a Trump supporter who voted uh, an absentee ballot for his dead mother. Uh, you know, so no wide scale voter fraud 
enfranchising more voters doesn't necessarily help the Democratic Party, but it does help voters. I'm pro-voter, and I would like to see every state making it easier for people to vote. Of course, you should have procedures in place to make sure that uh, uh, that the election is conducted with integrity. But uh, it, even in this high-stakes election, where you know so much was on the line, control of Congress, the presidency, lots of state races, the amount of fraud was very small. It was maybe the cleanest election the United States has ever had uh, because it was the most watched. People were looking for it. You know, you know um, Bill Barr you know, told his U.S. attorneys, go out and look for it. Uh, I think it was interesting. The, um, the U.S. attorney in uh, Georgia was essentially, uh, in uh, the, Georgia, the part of Georgia that covers Atlanta, was essentially fired for not uh, um, going after voter fraud aggressively. They brought in another uh, U.S. attorney from a different part of Georgia who had a reputation for going after voter fraud. And he just had a press conference the other day and he said, I looked and looked and there's no fraud. This was a clean election. So I think the lesson you know, we should learn is we can conduct fair elections. Making voting easier doesn't necessarily help the Democratic Party. It's good for all voters. And I would hope that we could walk away with that as, as one positive thing that uh, should come out of this uh, period. One, one of the great ironies about uh... Trump and his, you know, um, speechifying against um, mail-in voting was that one of the states that's had it for years and quite successfully is one of the reddest states in the country, Utah, just seemed very strange. So, I mean, that just sort of bears, bears up on the point that you made. I'd like to turn back to another um, a big picture question that came in from, from a couple of members of the audience. And that is, is what do you think that, um, Biden can do to heal some of the deep divisiveness in this country. I mean, we, we've seen in recent days that you clearly have people that all have what I call antisocial attitudes that broke into the Capitol, racist, um, um, anti-Semitic, um, anti-democratic. But there are some people who actually legitimately feel, it seems to me, left behind um, due to dramatic changes in the economy, um, and uh, other things that have happened. And uh, it seems that part of, and in some respects, I will venture just to start, the, start this off with you, that in some respects, you know, the Democratic Party um, hasn't paid enough attention to the problems of people who have, you know, you know in, whose industries have been withered, coal mines, um, shrinking auto plants and stuff like that. And those people are feeling dispossessed. Yeah, I th absolutely. I, I think this is somewhat out of the realm of law now, and we're talking yes. about uh, you know, just questions of sociology and, and politics and, and political culture. Um, uh, I do think it, it is tough because, uh, uh, you know, if, if the United States were a multi-party democracy, uh, you know, like many European countries, or I think of, uh, of Israel, where you form the coalition at the time of the government, you could have a, you know, uh, a party that is essentially urban and multicultural, and you could have another party that represents, uh, you know, the interest of, of, of farmers or, or a blue collar rural workers or whatever. And, and then they could come together to um, form a government, right? But that's not how our system works, right? We have this president who's elected in the electoral college system, which favors um, small states and, and appears to favor Republican candidates, right? You know, the, they were saying before the election that Joe Biden would have to win by at least two percent in order to uh, to um, capture, given the electoral college advantage that Republicans have. Um, and you have a uh, basically a plurality, winner take all kind of system for choosing uh, members of of uh, Congress. And so it's really hard to form those coalitions. And if you try to say, you know what the the Democratic Party should be more like what John Tester of Montana and Joe Manchin of of, um, uh, of West Virginia think because they need to attract those people. Well, you're going to get lots of complaints saying, no, the Democratic Party should look like, you know, the backbone of the Democratic Party is African-American women or AOC is the real future leader of the party. You know, it shouldn't, the face shouldn't be Chuck Schumer. You know, it should be, uh, you know, it should be uh, someone who is, is younger and and looks more like most of the people in the Democratic coalition. So it's a really hard question. I do think that's why Joe Biden was actually um, 
the Democrats' best bet for winning this election because, um, you know, so much of this election was a referendum on Trump. Um, and yet it, uh, Joe Biden was safe enough for those who might have felt dispossessed who had voted for Trump the last time to come back to uh, the Democratic fold. It may, um, Biden ran up his margins in the suburbs um, and, you know, I, 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 maybe Elizabeth Warren would not have been able to do that. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, he was he looked like the safe, you know, the old white guy looked like the safe candidate for the moment. Um, I don't know. I mean, we're putting a lot on Joe Biden to have to do. Uh, he's coming in, to, you know, with this pandemic, he's coming in with multiple crises and with um, a, you know, a, a a very upset minority of Americans. Now it's true that 74 million people voted for um, uh, Trump. Not all of them support the full Trump agenda. And I was happy to see that uh, in the last week, Trump's approval rating had fallen by about 10 points to the low 30s. And so that does show that, you know, even among Trump's supporters, there are many who think that the kind of anti-democratic strategy that Trump pursued at the end is something that's uh, impermissible. And sorry to jump in here, Henry and Rick, but of course, one of my duties is to announce when we only have about five minutes left and we're at that point. So uh, perhaps one more question, Henry, and we look forward to um, your, your thoughts, Rick. Thanks, Chris, very much. Um, Rick, um, I certainly concur with you about um, that Biden may be the best um, person to, for this task, and it's a very tough task at the moment. And I thought one of the things that was particularly, though, striking in, 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 in recent weeks was that Biden, who um, has been very cautious about a lot of things, um, you could see that he was, he was, his anger was growing um, as um, the uh, claims of fraud without any facts behind them uh, continued. And Biden did something that really surprised me. He said that the tactics that were being used harkened back to the Nazi propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels. What did you think about that? Well, you know, it was a, you know, th this was coming at a moment where I think our very democracy was under siege. I, I, I don't think there's another moment in our lifetimes that was anything like this. Um, the civil rights movement was incremental. This was a moment where, you know, you could have had the, the vice president could have been killed and, uh, and senators taken hostage and we wouldn't have had a vote for president because of a violent uprising. And I think it was appropriate to use that kind of strong language, even if I might not have uh, gone with the Nazi uh, comparison, but I think it showed the kind of rage. And so I don't want to end on rage. Let me say uh, that um, in the next week, there will be a moment for healing. And I think that Biden, given the kind of personal grief that he went through in his own life is perhaps uniquely situated to um, just be uh, a healer in chief. And this country, th there are strong divisions and there's you know, going to be a lot of investigations as to what happened on January 6th and there are going to be political recriminations, but this nation also needs healing after, you know, 380,000 deaths from coronavirus after this tumultuous election season, after this insurrection in the Capitol, uh, we hopefully will have a leader who will be able to bring us together as much as possible and help us to move forward towards a more perfect union. Rick, thanks very much. And I'd just like to say that I uh, fervently hope that the next time that we do a panel together, that the very least we can say that we had a peaceful presidential inauguration. And I'd like everybody to thank everybody in the audience for uh, joining in and uh, thank um, uh, all the people that were responsible for helping to put on the program and to, uh, as always, thank Rick for all of his illuminating responses. Thank you. And thank you, Henry, for the great conversation and set of questions. I always learn a lot when we go back and forth like this. Always a pleasure. Thank you, everybody, uh, for attending. And we hope very much to see you again at other UCI Law events. And thank you so much, Rick and Henry. Um, I wish everybody a very good evening. Take care. Bye-bye.